So I think we'll go ahead and start. I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, and welcome to today's lecture in the course on key concepts in macro development. This course is organized as part of the STEG program. STEG is an acronym for Structural Transformation and Economic Growth. And the STEG program is a multi-year research initiative led by the Center for Economic Policy Research in London and funded, and we're grateful for this, by the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office as part of the UK aid effort. I'm Doug Gollan. My colleague, Joe Kaboski and I are the academic leads for the STEG program. And along with a whole set of amazing colleagues at many universities around the world, we're excited to be offering this course. One of the explicit goals of the STEG program is to increase the number of researchers working on structural transformation of low and middle income economies and to increase the quantity, quality and relevance of their research. That's where you all come in. The world needs a lot of smart, motivated, energetic people who can help us understand the really challenging questions that we face in relation to the, the sources and patterns of economic growth and development. So with this course, we hope to share with all of you and, and anyone else with interest what we know and maybe more important, what we don't know about the topic. We're grateful that a lot of our colleagues have come together to contribute their time and their knowledge to putting together the course. And we really appreciate their goodwill and generosity. I'm particularly delighted that today we have Bertold Herendorf, a professor at Arizona State University to lecture on the topic, key theories of structural transformation. Having started with some facts and descriptions of the patterns of structural transformation, Berthold is gonna help us think about the broad classes of theories that might serve as frameworks for our thinking. So just a word or two about ground rules. Those of you who are in the virtual front row should please feel free to ask questions during the course of the lecture. Berthold has said he's happy to handle those questions. Others, please enter your questions in the Q&A section and um, I and others will try to answer as many of those as possible. Please be aware that if you use the, the hand button and try to put your hand up, the lecturer won't be able to see you. The lecture is being recorded and it'll be available on the STEG website and on YouTube for watching later. The presentation slides are available and I think the link is already in the chat window. So if you haven't already downloaded the slides and would like to have them to follow along, please um, take a look in the chat window. And on that note, and without any further ado, I'll turn things over to Bertolt. And thanks again. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Let me share my screen. So you should be seeing the slides now, do you? Yes. Okay, that's good. Let me start with a few organizational details. I've chosen a teaching assistant. His name is Santiago Garcia Calto. He's a PhD student here at ASU, was on the market, and he will join Georgetown, Qatar in the summer. So if you want to go to the World Cup next year, there's your guy on the ground who uh, already is talking about getting tickets for me. Anyway, more uh, professionally, his email is Santiago Garcia Calto at ASU EDU. Any questions you have, please contact him. There will be a tutorial session that Santiago holds on Monday, February 22nd, that's the coming Monday, at 4 p.m. UK time. I unfortunately will not be able to participate because that's exactly my teaching time for the undergraduates, but Santiago will be there. If you want him to answer any of your questions, just send him an email by 8 p.m. Sunday night UK time, and he will organize those for the session. Otherwise, he will talk about a problem set which I've put at the end of the slides. The purpose of this problem set is to try and bring everybody up to speed because I will be the first person who probably talks about a dynamic general equilibrium model. So far, it was about facts and accounting. So the technical demand of this lecture is somewhat higher. And I'm aware that we have a very heterogeneous group of people listening to the lecture. The purpose of the tutorial session is to help you catch up with what is in my lecture and give you some basic tools. The problem set is basically 
your way of practicing and then learning about the most basic version of the model that I'm going to discuss. Mine will be slightly more general, but that basic version has everything that you need to know if you want to solve a structural transformation model. Now, Santi got that same type of lecture from me five years ago, so he should know how to do it. Probably he knows it better than I do. And he will go through the derivations and answer questions in, on Mondays, in Monday's uh, tutorial session. The background paper for today's lecture is a handbook chapter that I wrote together with Richard Rogers and Anakaj Valentini. It's called Growth and Structural Transformation, and that's from the Handbook of Economic Growth in 2014. But this was kind of a stupid little thing because Akash and I got confused about the literature in 2008, and we wrote lecture notes. Lecture notes, which basically were of the nature, we don't understand exactly what's going on. Everybody uses a different type of framework. There's so many different little effects. So what are the main forces behind structural transformation? And then luckily for everybody, Richard got asked to write a handbook chapter about structural transformation. And he asked me and said, do you have any idea what we should write? Or are you interested in participating? And I said, yeah, I got these lecture notes here. And then Richard turned them into a very nice chapter with our help that I think has become a standard reference on growth and structural transformation. So I'm going to present core material from this handbook chapter. If you want more detail, please go to the printed version. In particular, I'm going to introduce the topic, then I talk about some stylized facts, a background model, then what we perceive as a benchmark model of structural transformation, and then I'm going to conclude. Introduction. It's always good to define what you're talking about. Structural transformation is the reallocation of economic activity across broad sectors of the economy. Kuznets, 50, 60 years ago, listed structural transformation as a key feature of modern economic growth. The typical split in sectors that people consider is agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Agriculture and manufacturing are both producing goods, so they are tangible, services produce intangible output. And then the difference between agriculture and manufacturing is that you presumably can eat agricultural output, but not manufacturing output, which uh, is true for everything except for processed food. So that's very progressive. So the notion is you can't eat processed food or you shouldn't at least eat it. But anyway, uh, so this broad distinction in different sectors has proven very useful. And it has turned out that structural transformation, the reallocation between these three sectors has important aggregate implications when and if the sectoral composition matters. So for example, important implications have been found for labor market outcomes, productivity, the skill premium, urbanization, et cetera. So the standard paper that is written on this, in this theme is of the nature, women don't do so well in agriculture, but do way better in services. What are the implications of a dramatic transformation from agriculture into a service industry for the labor force participation of women or the wage premium, uh, the wage gap between male and female salaries, et cetera. This is a subject on which I think uh, Rachel will uh, pick up and, and talk a lot about in the next lecture. So I'm just throwing this out here. The general way in which these papers are written is something differs across these sectors, hence a change in the composition has aggregate implications. Now I'm going to focus on models with balanced growth and structural transformation. I will uh, first present the stylized facts of structural transformation, then develop a multi-sector extension of the one sector growth model that is consistent with these stylized facts and that serves as a natural benchmark model to start study structural transformation. Lastly, I ask whether it's possible to simultaneously deliver balanced growth and structural transformation. 
Now that's actually harder than it sounds. And I uh, will report some success, but also some models where this doesn't work. You might wonder why do we worry about balance scrolls at all? Uh, the main reason is it's not only a feature that seems to come out of the data, but it also implies that you can solve the models much more easily. It's like Cobb Douglas production functions. Balance scrolls in Cobb Douglas production functions, they're your friend. Whenever that's in the model, you are in business. Whenever it's not, well, you can still do it, but for an old guy like me, you have to simulate stuff. And uh, I, I like balance scrolls because you can characterize the equilibrium analytically. Do interrupt me if you have questions or things don't make sense. Let's turn to the stylized facts of structural transformation. Before you talk about the facts, you always have to clarify how you measure the phenomenon you're after. So how to measure structural change or transformation. The three most common measures of sectoral economic activity are employment, value added, and final expenditure produced by a sector. Perhaps the most common one is employment shares because it's most commonly available. And they are calculated either by using workers or hours worked, if you have better data by a sector, depending on what's there. Value added shares and final consumption expenditure shares are typically expressed in current prices. I call them nominal shares. The advantage of using current prices is that everything is the same unit and naturally shares make sense. If you use constant prices, everything is still in the same units, but often it's debatable what constant prices to use and how good they are. So if you have current prices, the most natural thing, or perhaps the first thing to do is to calculate nominal shares. Now, if there are three measures, you wonder whether they all give the same answer. In a very broad brush sense, yes, but there are at least two reasons for differences among these three different measures. One is that investment and international trade imply that production and consumption don't necessarily coincide. Right? I can consume a lot of stuff that's produced in Europe, like my car, the wine I drink, etc., cetera, et cetera. And so the consumption measure might differ from the production measure. The second reason why these measures might differ is that value added is a distinct concept from final expenditure. Now, usually I say that, assume that everybody knows and then everybody nods and I move on. And over the years, I found that nobody has the foggiest idea what I'm really talking about when I talk about value added and final expenditure. So I should say nobody, but many people don't. So let's do one slide with some basic background concepts just to make sure we are all on the same page. Let's start really basic. What is an industry? It's a collection of establishments that produce similar goods or services. For example, the agricultural industry. They all produce edible, tangible output. Now establishments in these industries produce gross output by using the production factors, capital, labor, and intermediate goods. The establishments then sell the output either to final users, for example, households, to other establishments or to themselves. What's a sector? Sector is Sectors are aggregates of industries with similar characteristics. So the agricultural sector is all industries, forestry, fishing, uh, ag livestock production, etc., that are similar and can be summarized as agriculture. Now notice so far, there's nothing that relates to value added. I've talked about final uses and I've talked about gross output, which is final uses plus intermediate inputs for yourself and for others. But I haven't talked about value added. So value added is somewhat of an artificial concept if you really look at the data. 
It doesn't immediately come out of the data. You have to take the value of gross output and subtract from it the value of intermediate inputs. Having said that, you should be aware that while it sounds obvious, it's often challenging in the data to find information on both, and in particular, to find constant prices for both if you're interested in real value added. Other than that, value added is the value added over the use of the intermediate inputs, and uh, you subtract, you get it by subtracting gross output, the from gross output intermediate inputs. Distinct from that is final expenditure. It's not how much value you add, but how much you actually deliver as a sector in terms of gross output to final users. This would be households or exports or anything that doesn't get further entered in the production process and modified. So final expenditure therefore are composite of the value added from different sectors and the uh, composition of the final expenditure can be inferred from the so-called total requirement matrix. And we did that in a paper with the same co-authors in AER in 2013. So if you're interested in the details, go to that paper. I'm not going to have the time today to talk about that in this lecture. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the production measures of structural change, in particular employment shares and value added shares and give you some facts now. Let's start with currently rich countries, in particular Belgium, Spain, Finland, France, Japan, Korea, Netherlands, Sweden, the UK, and the United States. Why these countries? Because we found data for these countries reaching back till 1800. So what you see here is six plots, two for each of the three big sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and services on the x-axis is always the share in the top three, it's the employment share, and the bottom three, it's the value added share in current prices. So this is nominal shares. On the y-axis is the log of GDP per capita in 1990 international dollars. Richard talked about this, we want to use a unit that's the same in all countries so that we can compare GDP across countries, and we want to take into account purchasing power parity differences across countries. So international dollars do that. In the top three, as I said, it's the share of employment. And every dot is an observation from some year, which we don't care about. Important to us is that we have observations when these economies were really relatively poor. And observations when they were relatively rich. So each dot is an observation for a country and they're all put together. You can see a very clear pattern that is coming out of almost all documentations of the structural transformation facts. Namely, the employment share in agriculture is very large when you are poor and it falls to almost zero when you are rich. At the same time, the employment share of services is small when you are poor, and it increases to around 80% when you are rich. So agriculture is declining, services are increasing as GDP per capita increases. Manufacturing is somewhat of a weird sector because first, it is increasing in employment shares, but then there's a peak in the countries we have here, Korea is included, so the peak is fairly high at 0.4.5, but afterwards the employment share of manufacturing falls. This is often referred to as a hump shape or an inverted U shape. If you go one, was there a question? If you go one down, you see similar patterns for the value added shares. The agricultural shares fall, the manufacturing share follows a hump shape and the services share increases. 
Now, while they are similar, there are some differences. One prominent one is that the value added shares of agriculture for poor countries tend to be considerably smaller than the employment shares, which means that if you take value added per employed person, the productivity of agriculture is low in poor countries. Now, Duck has important work on this, many other people, which wonders why so many people are in agriculture in poor countries, although they are really bad at producing it in terms of productivity. The second common feature is that the peak in manufacturing is around nine of log GDP in 1990 international dollars. And that is also a GDP at which the value added share of services starts to increase. So you can think of this as not so much increasing and then an acceleration which happens here right around when the um, peak of the manufacturing share happens. Lastly, it's important to recognize that even in very poor countries, there are market services and they seem to be reasonably productive at it, at least compared to agriculture, which I conclude from dividing this by this. Now, these are currently rich countries and a very long time series. If you want to convincingly document facts, it's always a good idea to not only look at the time series of a few rich countries, but also at the cross section. And this is exactly what the next slide does. It uses the world development indicators because that has sectoral employment shares and the United Nations national accounts cross sections between 1980 and 2000 in the upper case and 1975 and 2005 in the lower case. I'm not gonna go into the details. As you go away from currently rich countries who have even historically often fairly good data quality, stuff becomes a little more blurred and you get more outliers. But I think uh, I can convince you with these two um, panels here that similar patterns as before hold also in the cross sections. That is agriculture falls, manufacturing follows a hump shape and services increases. Now the noise around that is important if you look at a single country or a group of countries, but I would interpret it not as invalidating the facts, but as being a deviation from the average, which then might be worth exploring. So you might ask, why is it that India has a large high-tech service sector, which is not that usual for a country of its GDP per capita? But don't get confused and view everything as one data point that has nothing to do with anything else. I think it's good to have two things in mind. One thing is what are the stylized facts that hold very broadly across time and countries and what is the particular situation in the country that I'm studying? And why would this be different from the broad facts? In order to be able to do this, one first has to understand what the forces behind the broad facts might be. So summary, when GDP per capita increases, the shares of employment and nominal value added, nominal being in current prices, decrease in agriculture, increase in services, and follow a hump shape in manufacturing. For low levels of development, meaning low GDP per capita, the value added share in agriculture is considerably lower than the employment share. That is, agriculture is relatively unproductive. The employment share and the nominal value added share for the services sector are bounded away from zero, even at very low levels of development. And for a log GDP per capita around nine, the increase in the nominal value added share in services accelerates and the nominal value added share for manufacturing peaks. Now the number nine is a little bit arbitrary, you should be aware of, 
because it depends on what prices I choose. This is in 1990 international dollars. If you move to more recent prices that might be underlying the current world table, the nine might change. The key thing is there is a middle income GDP, however you measure it, at which manufacturing peaks and services accelerate. So this is as much as I wanted to say about the stylized facts of structural change. In the handbook chapter, I looked at it yesterday. Again, there's a much more lengthy and detailed discussion. If you're interested, go there. It also includes measures of final expenditure. The basic broad brush conclusions don't change. They're the three key of patterns, namely decrease in agriculture, increase in services, some shape in manufacturing. And these are the three features that we would like a model to replicate. In order to be able to deliver such a model, it's useful to do a few background steps and look first at a two-sector version of the gross model. Now, why two sectors? Well, the standard version of the gross model has one sector. If I talk about the reallocation across broad sectors, that's a non-starter. There's no reallocation in the standard gross model. That's why we use it often because it's so convenient. There's no role for relative prices to do anything interesting either because every relative price is one or constant. A two-sector version is the first step of disaggregating it and this is gonna be useful because it links what the structural transformation literature does to what the previous literature has done that focused on consumption and investment. I will briefly go through that. And then I will disaggregate consumption and look at structural change or structural transformation within consumption, but keeping the structure of the two sector model the same. So this thing won't be thrown away. It's useful to go with me through that two sector model. It will just be the upper layer of a further disaggregate structure into agriculture, manufacturing, and services. The model goes back to Ozawa, and I'll present a version building on Greenwood, Herkowitz, Crisell. Environment, preferences, and endowments. There is an infinitely large representative household who has preferences over consumption sequences that are described by the following separable utility function. The sum from time zero to infinity of beta to the T times log of consumption. Beta is between zero and one and is the discount factor. We need that to keep this infinite sum finite. Endowments, there's one unit of time in each period and there's a positive initial stock of capital K0 which is larger than zero, so to, otherwise you won't get this economy off the ground. Technology, consumption C and investment X are produced from capital K and labor N. I'm going to follow the convention that uppercase let us refer to aggregate variables and lowercase variables to sectoral variables. So consumption and investment, I'm gonna call that aggregate and then capital is in each sector and labor in each sector. Production takes place in two separate sectors and the production functions are of the Cobb Douglas form with the same exponents. So for example, consumption is the capital in the consumption sector, Kc to the power theta times AC times NC, which is technical progress in the consumption sector times labor to the power one minus theta. Technical progress here in the way it's written is labor augmenting. We probably all know that it doesn't matter for a Cobb Douglas production function because you could bring it up in front, but here it's written as augmenting labor. Changes in, in A, represent exogenous labor augmenting technical progress in that sector. And notice that the changes in A don't have to be the same and they will in general not be the same. 
What is the same here is the exponents theta on capital in the consumption and in the, invest, in the investment sector. Now, at the beginning, this usually takes some getting used to because most people say, how plausible is that? Is that true in the data? And the answer is no. But it turns out that, first of all, it's extremely convenient, as I will show you in a minute. And second, you can still get the major developments of structural transformation if you assume this counterfactual equal exponents. So it's not true in the data, but it's not of first order importance for what we want to do. And it's convenient to assume these. So why is it convenient? I will uh, come to that in a second by showing you the results for this two sector model. Let me describe the environment first. Capital accumulates as usual. You start with the capital stock KT, use it for production in period T, then delta of it depreciates. So you're left with one minus delta KT. You add to that investment X and you get the capital stock in the next period. The depreciation rate is between zero and one as is usually the case. Capital and labor can be used in both sectors, implying that feasibility requires that the total capital stock is at least as large as the sum of the two sectoral capital stocks and total labor, which is normalized to one because there's a measure one of households, is at least as large as the total labor in the two sectors, NC and NX. Competitive equilibrium, I want to emphasize the role of relative prices and I therefore consider a sequence of markets competitive equilibrium as opposed to a planner problem. I could write down a planner problem where I only use preferences, technology and feasibility, but that by construction would not contain any prices and there's important information in what the prices do. Therefore, I write down a competitive equilibrium. The investment good is going to be the numerator. That means its price is equal to one in each period. And I'm going to denote the price of consumption relative to the investment good by P. The rental prices for capital and labor are denoted by R and W. I'm following the notation that everything aggregate is uppercase letters. So that's why R and W are uppercase. I'm not sure it's ideal, but that's what we did in the handbook chapter. And one rule is if you did something in the past, don't change it because you get confused. Um, so R and W are rental prices for capital and labor. I assume that the household accumulates capital and rents it to the firm. So the household owns everything, capital, labor, the firms here, which is the most natural way of writing down the gross model. Characterization of equilibrium. Now, if I was teaching at ASU, I would go to the board and do a few derivations and explain the steps. Since I only have an hour and 15 minutes, I'm not going to be able to do that here. So I'm just going to state main results in this model. And I'm going to refer you to Santiago's uh, tutorial session on Monday. So he's going to through the steps and hopefully derive everything if you are interested. If you have seen these models, this is fairly standard, but it needs to be said nonetheless, at least once. First, the capital to labor ratios are equalized across the sectors at each point in time. So KCNC equal KXNX equal the aggregate KN, and since labor is equal to one, equal the aggregate capital stock. That's crucial because it means that you can do a lot of things in this economy that you couldn't otherwise do. This comes directly from the fact that I assumed that the exponents in the Cobb Douglas production functions here are equal. If they're not equal, I would not get this result. With equal capital labor ratios, I can also show that the equilibrium value of the relative price of consumption to investment is pinned down by technology and equal to the inverse of the two labor augmenting technical changes. So if the, <coughs> excuse me, if 
<coughs> if the technical change term AX is very large relative to AC, that means labor is very productive in investment production relative to consumption production, then the price of investment is low relative to consumption or P, which is the price of consumption to investment is high. So it's the inverse. The price of something is high if the A, the technical change term in the production of the uh, item is low. So if you're very productive doing something, it's cheap. If you're not so productive, it's expensive relative to the other one. Second, equal capital to labor ratios mean that the model aggregates on the production side, by which I mean if you add investment and consumption in current in the same units, namely investment, which is the numerea, then you get output, why in this economy? And output Y is produced by an aggregate production function of the same form as the sectoral ones with the same theta, but now plugged in aggregate capital K and aggregate labor one. So if you express everything in terms of investment, you need the investment augmenting technical change term. If you did it the other way around and expressed everything in units of consumption, you would have the consumption augmenting technical change here. Santi is going to talk more about that. I'm just going to state that and you have to take it at face value from me. So capital labor ratios are the same. Prices are the inverse of the technical change terms and the production side aggregates. It is also true in this economy that the sectoral expenditure shares equal the sectoral employment shares. Now that's very convenient because it means that if I get the right behavior of the expenditure share, then I'm also going to get the right behavior of the employment share. We have seen in the data that they behave similarly. In the model, they are the same, so we don't have to worry about that. Lastly, I get the standard Euler equation from the household problem, which says consumption grows in terms of the numerea PCC, or I should say consumption expenditure grows in terms of the numerea equals the discount factor plus one minus delta plus the rental price for capital. Again, Santi is gonna derive all of this on Monday. We are interested in balanced growth. And since this is a multi-sector model, I will focus on aggregate balanced growth where balanced growth refers to the aggregate variable, but underneath there may be some changes. So I talk about an aggregate balanced growth path as an equilibrium path along which the cult effects hold for aggregate variables. That is constant growth of GDP per capita and capital per capita and constant capital GDP ratio real interest rate and capital income share and total income. Now for practical purposes and also to construct an aggregate balance growth path, I'm going to assume that the sectoral TFP growth rates are constant. So AIT plus one over AIT in each sector C or X is gonna grow at a constant rate gamma I. Notice that these constant rates may well be different. And in fact, they should be different because we know that equipment in particular, but investment more general has fallen in price relative to consumption. This would be captured here by having gamma for investment larger than gamma for consumption, right? There's more growth in technical change in investment. The relative price does the opposite. It falls when the A's grow a lot. Now, under these assumptions, you can show that a unique aggregate balance cross pass exists in this two sector model. So I can I ask a question? Of course you can. Yeah, so um, we said earlier that the two sectors have different growth rate. So for instance, the investment, uh, so, so the growth rate in the investment sector is higher than the growth rate of a uh, consumption sector. Then why do we get the constant growth rate for the whole economy? Is it because of the BOMOS, BOMOS disease we talked talk about before? Is it because, because the investment sector is higher, 
uh, TIP growth, then the and the relative price of the investment good will decrease, so that the uh, proportion of the investment sector in GDP has decreased. Is, is it because of that, or could you elaborate? Well, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, let's go back to slide 16 at the bottom, which defines GDP. It says GDP is x plus p plus c uh, times c. Now you point out correctly what's going to happen is. There's stronger growth in X than in C. But GDP is not X plus C because I have to add it in the same units. GDP is X plus P times C. So the, <coughs> the weaker growth in consumption is going to get offset by the fact that the relative price of consumption is going to increase. <coughs> right? Look at the relative price. If consumption doesn't grow much, but A, in investment grows a lot, then this relative price grows a lot. And what's going to happen is that X and the expenditure on consumption, they grow at the same rate. But X and C don't. So the trick is the relative price that converts C into units of X is going to make sure that they're both on the same footing and grow at the same rate. Does Thank that you. make sense? Yeah. Thank you. So Santi is going to talk more about this. It is a good question. And at the beginning, when you haven't seen many multi-sector models, you get confused by this. Some people get still confused, although they have seen a, a lot of those. But the key thing is always make sure that everything is in the same units and you take into account both the real growth of the item you look at and the growth of its price. Let's put it differently we are getting this massive increase of equipment. Why isn't that blowing up our GDP? Well, at the same time, the price of equipment is falling so much. So my computer is always $1,500, although the computer becomes better every four years dramatically. Right? The computer becomes better, but the price falls. I always spend the same. So that's the basic idea. here. Other questions? It's not the case. Let me then talk about structural change. So far, there's no structural change. There's just consumption and investment, as, and as Jean uh, Lung has, has pointed out, they grow at the same rate if expressed in the same units. Now, I'm going to now present a benchmark model of structural change, which is going to disaggregate consumption and focus on structural change within consumption. I will present three classes of preferences that give you structural change and then assess whether they are consistent with aggregate balance growth paths as defined before. Now, I should say a couple of more sentences. This is a benchmark model that focuses on structural change within consumption, which is a natural first step to take because consumption is roughly 80, 85% of total GDP in most developed economies. It does leave the question open, what happens to the rest? And I'll get a little bit to that as we go through. But first, let's talk about how you might generate structural change within consumption. The first class of preferences, the generalized Stone-Geary preferences that Richard Akash and I used in the AER paper that we had in 2013, where you disaggregate the C from before into an aggregator that depends on consumption of agricultural goods, manufactured goods, and services. In front, there are weights, omega A, M, and S, and the exponents here don't let them distract you. They're there so that the limits of these specifications are the right ones. More importantly, epsilon minus one over epsilon is the exponent on all three uh, consumption items and then you take it the inverse. So that's a CES production um, utility function with an elasticity of substitution between the three that's equal to epsilon. Now it's not a CES in the strict sense because there are additional terms here, C bar A and C bar S, which are constant terms, both positive. And they imply that this utility function is not homothetic. What's a homothetic utility function is one you can scale up and down. If you double all expenditure, you double all the, um, utility, all the consumption of each of the different categories. 
So if the bar terms here were zero, this would be homothetic. Non-zero bar terms introduce non-homotheticities, which is a fancy way of saying you consume more of some goods than others, and it changes as income changes. The income elasticity, in other words, of these different goods is not one. This can be best illustrated if you look at the implied demand system, and I've written it here at agriculture over manufacturing expenditure, services over manufacturing expenditure. First, it's a familiar term from CES, utility functions, it just depends on the relative price. It's fixed ideas. If epsilon is one, then I have log special case up there. The relative price doesn't matter. The expenditure shares are constant. If epsilon is larger than one, you substitute what that means. If the relative price of something goes up, the expenditure share is going to go down. And if epsilon is smaller one, the opposite happens. You have complements. If the price goes up, the expenditure share goes up because you don't substitute as much as the price increased or more. So that's the standard CES here. The non homothetic constants add additional terms here, CA bar and CS bar, that are deviations from the standard CES. In particular, in the case of agriculture, there's a constant term that you add. So if you are decide what to do in agriculture, you first have to satisfy that constant term, and then the CES comes. The same is done in services, but you subtract that term. Often the interpretation is this is subsistence consumption. You have to eat a minimum amount of calories, otherwise you die. Think of this as CA bar. The C bar is often interpreted as home production, even if you don't purchase any services in the market, you still get some for free, so to speak, from a market perspective. And these are the ones which you produce yourself. So what that means is that if you're poor, you first satisfy, want to satisfy your subsistence consumption of agriculture. You are happy with your um, home production of services, so you subtract something. So if you're poor, you will spend relatively much on agriculture and relatively less on services. If you then increase your expenditure, you will increase the expenditure on manufactured goods. And ultimately, these two terms will converge to zero and you go to a CES. So this is a very simple and cheap way of generating non homotheticities which imply that when you're poor, your composition is biased towards agriculture. And when you're rich, it goes more and more into services. You can already see how structural transformation is almost hardwired into this specification. Now, I want to, um, for those of you who have seen more in this literature, make a few remarks of two recent papers that uh, generalized this specification. So we were perfectly happy with this specification. And then, as always in life, somebody comes out and says, oh, it doesn't always work. And there are some shortcomings. And you get slightly pissed off. I discussed this paper. I didn't like it at the beginning. Now I like it. So obviously, progress means somebody points out something better. And one better specification is Kumin Lashkari Mysteri. That's in the fourth, fifth, or sixth round. I don't know of Econometrica. I lost track. They basically use what's called a non homothetic CES, the same as before the weights. Then there is the consumption of agriculture, manufacturing, oh, sorry, and services. And now they introduce non homotheticities in a different way, not through constant terms as we did, and many people before us, so I shouldn't claim here that's the invention of this paper, but we used it. They introduce non homotheticities by putting consumption with an exponent in front of agriculture and services. So intuitively, what that does is as consumption grows, you can have different weights depending on how much consumption you have on agriculture and services. So in particular, if you want that services get more and more of the expenditure as you become richer, you're going to make the weight on this C here large, and you make it on this C small. The implied demand system is the same as before in the first part, which is the relative price effect. 
And then you can see there is the consumption term that is in front here. And it depends on how you choose the sigmas, whether a good becomes more or less important as consumption grows. And then there's another paper by Timo Boppert that does something similar. He uses Pickle preferences. I can never remember what Pickle stands for. It's price independent generalized linearity, which doesn't tell you much. But the demand function people use this. I'm not going to go into the details of this specification much. I just mention it. It's an indirect utility function, which depends on expenditure and the prices of goods and services. And he again gets a demand system, which depends on relative prices and on expenditure. So a similar, a different way of getting something similar, the share of your expenditure on goods here depends on relative prices and it depends on how much expenditure you have. Now, if you are interested in that, there's an excellent recent paper by Timo Bockwart himself and then Alder and Müller in the Asia Macro, where they generalize it to many goods. The original paper just had goods and services. I just flag this for those who are particularly interested or somewhat more advanced. If you didn't understand the word I said when they, I discussed this slide, that's fine. Um, just ignore it. For now, we have three different specifications. And the key thing is, as already in the simplest specification, there's relative price effects and there's effects of income that come through non homothetic terms in the simplest form, the constant CA and CS. So I need to also specify technology. I'm going to stick to the Cobb Douglas production functions with equal shares. But now I'm going to assume that there's production functions for each consumption category, agriculture, manufacturing, and services separately. Right before it was consumption investment. Now it's agriculture, manufacturing, services, and investment. But the functional forms are the same. And since the equal shares in the equal exponents in the Cobb Douglas worked so well before, I'm going to use them again. For those who want some further hints on the literature, there are three generalizations of that. In an important paper in JPE, Atzimoglu Guerrieri gen generalized the technology to allowing for different exponents on the different production functions. And then we, uh, I mean, we, uh, Akos and Chris Harrington and I wrote a paper in the HA Macro where we estimated CES production function and explored what that does to structural change. And a full blown uh, model analysis of that is in Alvarez, Guadalajara, and Poshka, which is in theoretical economics in 2017. Again, this is not meant as essential for this lecture, but just as some suggestions for further readings for those who are more interested. So you can generalize this, but it's tedious. The most straightforward thing is to work with these. Remarks, the literature often works with only three production functions, assuming that all investment is produced in the manufacturing sector. Instead, I have here used four distinguishing agriculture, manufacturing, and services, and that's just consumption. And then there's one investment sector where nothing interesting happens in structural change. Why have I done that? Assuming that all investment is produced in the manufacturing sector is not supported by the data. An easy way of showing that is that in the last 10 years, US investment exceeded the value added, the total value added of US manufacturing. So you can't possibly assume that all investment is produced in manufacturing because investment is more than manufacturing value added. Why can that be? Think of software. Software is an investment. It's not produced in the manufacturing sector and it's becoming a bigger and bigger part. I have therefore left investment separate so that structural change happens only within consumption. Having said that, view that as a natural first step. As always, you got to start somewhere and you better start somewhere simple. Otherwise, you don't understand what you, what you get. 
We since then have continued working and in a recent paper with Richard and Akos, which I think is coming out in the Review of Economic Studies sometime this year, we characterize structural change within investment as well. And we focus as in this paper on the aggregate balance cross paths. I should mention there's a companion paper that was independent of ours by Garcia Pijuan Maseria Corta, which again takes gazillions of rounds in Econometrica and they do the same that we did, but they characterize investment, the structural change in investment along transition paths to the aggregate balance growth paths. So our paper is aggregate balance growth, theirs is the transition path, which I admit is a lot harder to do uh, because you don't have analytical solutions anymore. So if you're interested in structural change within investment, there are two papers that are currently at the frontier and that to talk about this. I should add, it's very messy. It took us forever to understand how to characterize it along the aggregate balance growth path. Uh, but it's done. I don't want to do it in this lecture because I want to focus on the essentials. So let's go back. Structural change within consumption. And then there are some stupid feasibility constraints as before. So in this benchmark model, I have the same key properties from before continue to hold. In particular, the capital to labor ratios are going to be equal to the aggregate capital labor ratio as before. Why? Because I have four Cobb Douglas instead of two, but the exponents are all the same. Still, the relative prices are determined by technology. So relative price of two things is the inverse of the technical change terms. Again, the four sectors aggregate on the production side. So I have an aggregate production function of aggregate output. And this was Jing Lung's question. Why? Because I'm taking the product for each sector of price and output, and output does whatever it does, but prices offset this so I can aggregate everything up. The four sector model aggregates on the production side and the sectoral employment shares continue to equal the sectoral expenditure shares, which is convenient. So I have just to look at one and I know I characterize the other. I can then analyze this more complicated model with four sectors by breaking the household problem into two sub problems. One is the intertemporal problem from before. I allocate total income among the composite consumption goods C and savings, which turn into investment. And then there's a static problem where I allocate the period consumption expenditure, PC, the PTCT, among the three different consumption goods, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. So going through the two sector model before, is useful to understand the intertemporal problem. What's new is the composition of consumption follows from a static problem now, and the structural transformation that I'm trying to generate, and we'll show you in a second how it results, is going to happen within consumption, where the two sector structure is totally unaffected, but within consumption there's reallocation and the patterns that I showed you before will happen. Before I show you the two key results, are there any questions or things I should clarify better before I move on? Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. I have a question about the uh, like total investment existing uh, the manufacturing. Uh, how about if we kind of uh, add the durable consumptions that treat like uh, non-durable and uh, durable consumptions and uh, separately, uh, separate sectors, would, would that help? Like explaining and also taking out inventories from investment uh, measurement, how, how much, to what extent would that help? Uh, um, so it's a good question. What you are referring to, if I understand correctly, is that in the national accounts, the stock of durable consumption goods like washing machines, furniture, etc is not capitalized, it's not part of the capital stock, okay? And the investment in durables is expensed, not expensed, is counted as consumption expenditure, but not as investment that leads to a stock. Now, if you 
reallocate the investment in durables and add them to the total investment that's otherwise out in the economy, you make the problem worse because you increase investment even further. The manufacturing sector is what it is. Already without durables, the total investment exceeds manufacturing value added. So if you add some more, you make it worse. Inventories won't help you. It's actually very stark. What happens basically is that about half of investment is services. And you have to take that into account if you want to match the composition of investment seriously to the data. Now, as I already talked about software, think of other things. When you build a house, there's design services, architectural services, there's transportation services, there's hotel and retail services of all the materials that you put in the house. So the house looks like a physical thing and you say, well, that was produced by the manufacturing sector. In particular, where I live in Phoenix, every house looks the same, standardized manufacturing sector. But you overlook when you do that, that there's a huge service component in these physical things because you, for starters, have to get them from where they were produced to where you sell the house. I have a stove for being pretentious from Italy. So it was expensive to ship it over. And then there was a wholesaler here. And then there was a retailer here. And then it was put into my house. So there is even in that physical house is a large service component. And what we argue in the paper, you have to take that into account. It's an, it's an excellent question, but it's, it's, it's hard to weasel out there. It is so stark that if you really want to do this, you, you should think about structural change within investment. Other questions? Thank you. That's very helpful. I may ask a question, sir. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I know this is a benchmark model, but uh, I wonder that if we can handle this issue within the heterogeneous agent framework, because when I think about st uh, structural transformation, uh, what comes to my mind is that uh, the, the switch of the labor market within the in the different industries. So, uh, to, to fix ideas, so this is a representative agent model or, or representative household model. So there's no heterogeneity within the households. But what happens is that each household is going to allocate its labor among producing investment, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. So within the household, you can allocate different shares of your total time endowment of one, two different sectors, and that can change over time. Now, another question that I sense from your uh, excellent question is, what happens if I have different households? Maybe some are educated or not so educated. Some are single, some are married. Some have a comparative advantage for agriculture for some reason. Others have a comparative advantage for services, perhaps of education. You can extend this model and ask questions in this context because the production side is going to be similar, but now you have to work on the, uh, on the preference side, on the household side and make it more complicated. Some people have started to do this. I don't want to do it here because I want to give you the benchmark model. And it's kind of hard. It's not hard, but it's, I always find it useful to think of the most simple framework that has the essence of the key effects. Once you understand that, you can complicate. If you start with a complicated one, chances are you never get the simple effects. And that's why I'm not, I'm not doing that. Okay, but it's a good question. And um, you can uh, check, some people have worked on it. I think Rachel is going to talk in the next lecture about um, such distinction between men and women or skilled and unskilled. I don't do it in, in this basic framework. Thank Other you. questions? Well, if that's not the case, I have about 10 minutes left. Let me come to the key results then. Key results. The first key result, as I see it, is from a paper of Consamut, Rebello, and G in the Review of Economic Studies, and I'm going to have labeled this income effects. Take the utility function that we used in our AAR paper. Here it was, 
and impose that epsilon is equal to one. If epsilon is equal to one, this utility function reduces to a special case, which is called stone geary and that's log utility. And here it is. Where is it here? So if epsilon is equal one, the CES goes away and I have a log utility in agricultural consumption minus the constant term, manufacturer consumption and services consumption. On top of that, assume that all sectors counterfactually, but just for the purpose of this proposition, have the same growth rate of technical change. So the gamma i's are all the same. If this is the case, then there is an aggregate balance growth path and along the aggregate gowns growth pass, employment and expenditure shares are constant for investment, they decrease for agriculture, they increase for services, and they're constant for manufacturing. So under these stark assumptions, you get structural change out of agriculture into services, but you don't get the hump shape in manufacturing. At the same time, you still get an aggregate balance growth path. So why is that the case? Essentially, everything is growing at the same rate, but these constant terms, CA and CS, are gonna lead to reallocation. Think about it as follows. If CA is close to C bar A, this number is very small and the curvature is very steep here. So you wanna allocate a lot to agriculture if you're poor, and your consumption of agriculture is close to C bar. You don't worry much about services because you get that constant term for free. So even if your service purchases were zero, you would still not be at a corner. Now take that economy and let it grow. The relative importance of this bar term here and this bar term there diminishes as you grow. And ultimately you go towards a Cobb Douglas function where it's lock consumption of agriculture, manufacturing and services. So you go through a composition, omega A, omega M and omega S in the limit. Hence you go out of agriculture towards omega A, you go into services towards omega S and you get structural change, but not in manufacturing. Second key result, Nyan Pissaridis, relative price effects. Suppose that the growth rates of technical progress are strongest in agriculture, second in manufacturing, and third in services. Suppose that the non homothetic terms C bar A and C bar S are zero. And suppose that the elasticity of substitution between these different consumption goods is smaller than one. There is an aggregate balance growth pass again along which employment and expenditure shares are constant for investment, they decrease for agriculture, they increase for services, and they lie somewhere in between the other two shares for manufacturing. So as before, I get structural transformation out of agriculture and into services. I don't get a constant share of manufacturing necessarily anymore, but it's not clear that I get a hump shape either. So these were the two first models that broke the ground and that highlighted the two main effects, namely income effects in conjunction with non homothetic utility functions that lead to reallocation, even if there's no price changes. Notice here, if all the gammas are the same, the relative prices won't change. Or different gammas that lead to relative price changes, but no income effects because the utility function is homothetic, all the bar terms are zero. And then I get reallocation within consumption just from price effects. In order to form intuition, it's useful to go to the extreme case, think of a Leon TF. If gamma A is the strongest in all sectors, that means agriculture has the strongest technolo technological progress which means that the relative price of agriculture is falling. You're not changing anything in your real consumption bundle. The relative price is falling. What happens with the share? It's going down. Similarly, gamma S is the smallest. So the relative price of services is increasing, 
you're not changing your bundle in the Leontief case, which is the extreme form of epsilon smaller than one. So services become more and more expensive, the share you spend on services is increasing. So that's a very mechanical and simple way of getting, you move out of agriculture and you move into services. The hump shape is more challenging. Additional results about the hump shape. The paper by Kumin, Lishkari, and Mistieri shows that over very long periods, our utility function wasn't useful because the income effects are persistent. And with our non-homothetic CES utility function, the income effects come for constant. So basically what happens if you go back to our uh, demand system here, the non-homothetics come from constant terms and as PM CM grows and grows and grows, these things converge to zero. So in the limit, they disappear. What they point out is that income effects seem to be persistent over long periods of time. So their specification is more useful because the income effect doesn't go away. So you have that C here all the time, no matter how rich you are. And then they do similar things as I just discussed. They show that persistent and income effects and the usual relative price effects can replicate agricultural and service shares over the long horizon. But there's some challenge still with the hump shape in manufacturing. They no longer get an aggregate balance growth pass, but an asymptotic aggregate balance growth pass. And then a recent paper by Aldo Muller Boppard uses the generalized Piggle preferences. It's going to be in print in AJ Macro, I think this year. Again, they model persistent income effects over long horizons and the usual price effects, and they get everything. They replicate all shares, including the hump shape in manufacturing over long horizons, and they have an aggregate balance cross pass. So, in terms of achieving this, what we want, namely aggregate balance growth and the stylized facts, that's as it stands, the gold standard. It's a little bit, um, a little bit unfortunate is that they use an indirect utility function, namely this generalized Piggle specification, which is not always the most intuitive way of getting things. It's flexible, so you can generate what you see in the data, but it's a little bit hard sometimes to keep track where the effects come from. Still, I think if you want the best model to replicate the stylized facts, it's this one. Which leads me to conclude, I've shown you that there are clear stylized facts of structural transformation. Agriculture shrinks, manufacturing follows a hump shape and services expand. I've illustrated in a benchmark model of structural change, two main forces. One is relative prices change with a low elasticity of substitution, meaning that different goods are complements in the extreme case, Leontiev. And so the sector with a low productivity growth will expand because you don't substitute much and the share you spend on this will go up and the sector with a high productivity growth will contract. Why? Again, you don't change the composition much and the share you spend on it will decrease. In the model, the expenditure and the employment shares do the same thing. So once I have the expenditure shares, I know it's true also for employment shares. The second effect that I've highlighted is that income changes can lead to structural change when there are different income elasticities. Luxury goods, which are the ones that have increasing shares and higher income elasticities expand when you develop. So these are the services and necessities as agricultural goods contract because they have an income elasticity, smaller one. So the share goes down as you develop. The CES and the Piggle utility generate these forces and are consistent with aggregate balance growth paths. And the non homothetic cess, which I forgot to mention here, can generate these forces as well, but is not consistent with aggregate gallon growth paths. Instead, it asymptotically has aggregate balance growth, but along the transition, it won't. <laughs>
Now, there's many different ways in which you could generalize the results I've shown you. I've hinted at some developments which took place since we published that handbook chapter in 2014, which is already almost six, seven years ago. There's many more. We also have a discussion in the handbook chapter about future research and what we think might be useful. If you want an updated version, we have uh, Richard Akos and I published a paper in uh, the review of the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, I believe it was in 2019, where we talk about some future, some more current developments. So there's a lot of work being done currently. I think it's fair to say that the benchmark model is still a useful starting place, but lots of stuff and exciting stuff has happened since. And Rachel, in the follow-up lecture, will talk about some of it. And the other you will find in the journals. So that's all I had to say. I think I did exactly an hour, 15 minutes, given I started a little late. And I'm open for questions until 10.30. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bertold, and thanks for being so prompt. Please, um, those of you with cameras and mics, please feel free to go ahead and pepper Bertold with questions for the next 10 minutes. Don't be shy. Guys, another question. Yeah, you know, but you only got two, okay? Okay. Uh, so what, what is the... Um, so we saw that the manufacturing is hamshipped. Uh, what is your most preferred explanation for this hamship? What is the intuition behind? That's actually a good question, and I'm not sure I have an answer. So there's, there's different ways of, of generating it. One, the, the only one I covered in this lecture was the Aldo Müller Bopper paper. But there it comes from flexible income effects. And so somewhat by construction, you can get it if you free up your preferences and you have strong and then weaker income effects. So imagine if you're relatively poor, you want a lot of manufacturing goods, no matter what they cost. If you get richer, you want less and less manufacturing goods. So that, that, that's one way. Another way is to um, free up the constraint that technological progress grows at constant rates. Okay, so it, it, I, I don't know the exact uh, facts out of the top of my head, but I'm under the impression that that's a good, a reasonable assumption, say for the post-war US, but not a reasonable assumption over 200 years. Okay, but uh, I think it's, I just refereed on the weekend, the paper that was exactly about the hump shape. And I think, uh, there is a lot of interesting work, but it's not ultimately settled where it comes from. I've always, in my own work, I've stayed away from it, somewhat wimping out saying this is kind of difficult and, and, and messy and I, I haven't dealt with it. But I think it must have to do with the fact that the technical progress is not constant over a very long horizon in manufacturing and that the nature of the manufacturing goods that you consume and how much you want of it changes over time, right? Think about it, you're very poor in agriculture. You want some basic furniture, you want some basic housing and everybody goes into that. Now we sit in big houses, we have everything. You want a somewhat better computer, a somewhat better car. Maybe you want some services much more than the additional manufactured goods. So I think that's what essentially the preferences that are flexible capture and my hunch is that drives it, but I'm not an expert on that question. But it's again, the second excellent question, Jingo. Thank you. Anybody? Uh, Mayor, uh, okay. So uh, I was uh, wondering, so as the GDP per capita increases, uh, do poor countries move to manufacturing before they move to services or is it like, uh, like if we go from very less to very high and we directly skip manufacturing and jump into services. Sorry, um, I had some trouble getting the connection. Can you ask the question again, please? Sure. Uh, I was asking if the GDP per capita increases or uh, does it exit culture, heavy economy, does it, can it move from exit culture to services directly or is that transition always through manufacturing? 
if I understand correctly, and I apologize if I don't, because there was some uh, disturbances in the, in the connection. If I understand correctly, there are exceptions where economies have not developed the manufacturing sector as much as others and jump to services directly. I don't know where you are from, but this is sometimes something people say about India. That the service sector is unusually large in India compared to the average um, experience and the manufacturing sector is not so large. Now, if you want to understand developments like this, one way to think about it is that in Germany, where I come from, the manufacturing sector is still unusually large, although we are fairly developed. And the reason is we are just pretty good at producing cars and machinery and equipment, and we export a lot of it. In other countries like Britain, which is at a similar level of development, with all due respect, they're not very good at producing cars. I had one once, I will never buy one again, and they don't exist anymore. And if they exist, they're run by German companies. So their manufacturing sector is relatively small, but they have the city of London. Right? So they export a lot of financial services. They are very good at this. We are not so good at this. Have you ever been to Frankfurt? You know why. It's kind of a boring, dull place. And we don't have a comparative advantage in that. So if you take trade into account, which I've completely blocked out here, you can get fairly sizable deviations from the average behavior, right? Because you don't have to produce every, let me put it differently to you. I assume that everything that you consume, you have to produce yourself. With trade, that's not the case. And so with trade, the consumption composition may differ to a sizable extent from the production composition. Now, this is an insight that Kiminori Matsuyama had about 15 years ago. And again, it's something that's not in the benchmark model, but that's important to think about. And there's some work on that where people, uh, K. Muyi comes to mind in the journal Monetary Economics 2013 has a nice paper on that. But that's, that's a good question. If that was your question, I hope I didn't uh, butcher it. And it's an oh, important yeah. question. Yeah, that was my question. So yeah, I was thinking about the uh, yeah, I I'm from India and I was thinking about India and I was also thinking about the comparative advantage uh science. So yeah. Yeah. Um could I ask something about uh nesting this model in sort of an international Can you speak up a little bit, Holt? Sorry, could I, could I ask something about putting this into, into an international framework? It kind of builds on something that uh, was being said in the comments, but uh, all of these models have just exogenous TFP growth. But if you look at the current situation where some countries clearly have much higher productivity, let's say in agriculture than others, what are some of the barriers that keep countries with very low agricultural productivity from essentially adopting the TFP of much more pro agriculturally productive uh, regions? I mean, that's an excellent question, which is almost too excellent in the sense that it goes way, way beyond the structural change model. Um, and you're exactly right. The structural change model is a framework in which I do not answer why TFP is what it is. I say, given what TFP is, what is the composition of the economy? So a whole set of other questions and I think that would be probably much more of an expert in those than I am is, why are poor countries relatively inefficient in doing agriculture? And there's a huge literature, Gibo Estuccia and many others have contributed to that. And it's, I think we understand a little more why that is. There are certainly some barriers. There's certainly human capital differences. There's the uh, perils of subsistence farming and inefficient use and allocation of land to people. But I don't want to go into the details of that. First of all, I haven't prepared for it, but it's also somewhat of a separate issue. I like to think of what determines TFP and then take TFP and ask what determines the composition of the economy as a result of TFP. And mine has entirely been about the second question takes away, it doesn't take away from the first question being very interesting, but I have really nothing to say about this here, right? I've assumed everything is coming from heaven and it is what it is. And now let's see what happens. Okay. 
I think Sharon is going to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, um, Prof, so you, um, in the last part of your section, you make a lot of recommendation on this paper. And I think uh, one that resonates to an African perspective in terms of um, our structure of the structural transformation is industrial policy. And there hasn't been a lot of papers that do this work in a, in a theoretical format. So I was thinking um, of industrial policy in sort of like a theoretical format uh, and looking at the consumption function that you've put to ask if someone was to play around with the consumption function in particular on the manufacturing side and probably um, maybe allocate the constant consumption somewhere um, along that manufacturing uh, constant consumption, would that also assist to probably ramp up the efficiency in which the, the um, manufacturing sector operates? Because industrial policy is quite an important sector, I mean, an important um, factor in, in determining what happens uh, within growing the manufacturing sector in Africa. And we speak about a lot, but we have not tried to model that and include it in the framework of structural transformation. So uh, perhaps can, you, can I ask that you at least talk about that a little and assist how does one even try and include it in the models that we're trying to work with here? Thank you. And another excellent question. Uh, I have to admit, it's one that I heard before I gave uh, essentially this talk at an IMF uh, training session about 12 months ago. And they asked me exactly this question. And I said, it's a great question. I have nothing to say about it, but we will work on it over the summer. Well, then the coronavirus happened and lots of other things distracted me. I don't think, I think you're completely right, Sharon. There's not much work on that. This framework cannot, as it is, tell you much about it because it says, given what the productivities are, what is the composition? But it doesn't say again, and this is related to Holt as well, where the productivities come from. If you want to think about industrial policy, that's the focus of the analysis, and we have very little on that. We tried to make some progress and we got stuck. I can only say uh, um, Richard Akos and I have agreed to meet again in April, and that will be the subject of what we think, namely um, what types of policies are interesting to consider in these models. Now notice one thing, the equilibrium of the model that I have characterized is efficient. There is no room for policy here, therefore, to improve it. So what that means is I have a model that fits the data, but the government should stay out of it given this model. Now I'm not thinking that uh, necessarily that industrial policy is bad and should always be avoided. I'm just saying this model cannot speak about it to it at all. So I agree with you, Sharon, bleak situation, but that's one subject on which you could focus. And I think it's an important subject because in the practical world, if you talk to the IMF guys, that's all they care about. If you tell them the world is efficient, the next conclusion is why are you here? You're rent because you don't do anything good. They don't like that conclusion. You know, by the fact that they make a lot of money, they think they're important. Therefore, you have to write a model in which they are important to speak to them. And we are going to try and do that because I want to get invited again to the IMF. Listen, I'm going to intervene here because I know that Berthold um, has, in fact, a, an important appointment to get to. And I just want to thank you, Berthold. I wonder if those of you in the front row um, would be willing to unmute your microphones and so that we can give Berthold a kind of old fashioned round of applause out loud. And uh, just thank you again, Berthold, for making the time and for, and for a great and clear lecture. Thank you. That's an impressive round of applause. It was a pleasure. I like, the, I like the icon, the applause icon, but it doesn't resonate in quite the same way. And yeah. thank you again for the time. Um, I'll pass along your comments about the British automaking industry um, <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for taking part, for the questions from the front row, for the questions from everyone um, in the Q&A. We're trying to figure out a way to post the Q&A content along with the slides and other things um, on the website and to provide as much of the material as we can. But Bertold, thank you so very, very much.
And great appreciation to you. I would also like once again to thank uh, Mandy and Kirsty and Lauren and the team at CEPR for putting this together and for sticking around late on a Friday evening. So many thanks. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week when we continue on. And um, for those of you in the front row who are gonna be available um, for the TA session on Monday. We look forward to seeing you there. A couple of people commented in the Q&A. We really haven't figured out a good way to do the, to make the TA sessions available for, we're kind of wrestling with the challenge that a TA session is necessarily small and we haven't quite figured out a way to provide more than basic content. So we'll keep working on that and see what we can do. But um, again, thanks to everyone and we look forward to your feedback. Please let us know if there's if you have comments or feedback for us. Just one question, Doc. Uh, one, one last question. So is the TA session also gonna be posted, the video, so that those who can't attend it can see it? I I think um, I think that's a question for Santi and also for the participants themselves. We don't wanna smother participation um, if people are nervous about having their questions um, going to the world, but maybe that's something we can figure out. I mean, it would be nice for those who are excluded if they want to see what he I said. Agree. I don't know. I, I, wanna, I haven't talked to Santi, but knowing him, no. he's... On, on my end, you, you have yeah, you have the approval. So if you want to do it and the participants agree with that, then we are All fine. Right. Well, we'll try to sort that out before, before we go live and we'll let people know. But thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. And thanks again, Virtual.